it's really great to see you again. I'm sure many of uh, the members of our community in uh, HR Fest in Hungary is uh, going to be very happy to see you again. Uh, but for those who probably haven't seen you in earlier occasions, um, could you just please introduce yourself briefly um, in what you exactly do at NASA, what your position really covers, so people would understand sure. why we are starting this conversation about the talent issue today. Yeah, well, first, thank you for having me on. This is very generous of you to have me on. Uh, so I am Steve Rader. I am the current program manager for our Center of Excellence for Collaborative Innovation and in our NASA Tournament Lab at NASA. And what that means is that, that our organization works across uh, not just the NASA organization, but actually across the entire U.S. federal government to help organizations to understand what open innovation and open talent are and some of these new resources in the future work and to actually be able to adapt or adopt those practices and use them. So uh, our focus started very much in the open innovation world. So crowdsourcing, specifically crowdsource challenges. Uh, and over the last few years, it has actually expanded into some more kind of future of work areas where we are providing access to uh, open talent platforms as well, and really starting to, to, to use that transition to finding the skills that you need at the time you need them uh, and dealing with that, that entire issue that I'm sure a lot of your, your folks are uh, dealing with as well. So that's our role. Uh, and we've been around for about 10 years now uh, and have done about 600 projects uh, overall. Wow. Which, uh, have done a lot of, of great stuff. We actually access 40 different crowdsourcing communities uh, that represent about 120 million people worldwide. Wow, those are really impressive numbers. Um, so on my side, um, as you know, because we have discussed about it, we are just starting a new magazine and our first issue is about the talent issue, which we, I think, globally face both on the attraction side and also on the retention side. So these open source and, and platforms are really interesting, um, I think, for all of us. So can you share a little bit about the future of work effect? As you sure. said, that this was the beginning of all this. How do you see with all the pandemic impacts and all the other circumstances and with all this really rapidly changing environment, what the future really holds for us as the workplace? Yeah, you know, we've, we've done a lot of reflection on this because we really were trying to understand what was happening. Why, why was crowdsourcing important to have to be able to do? And why, why are these crowd platforms that we're doing just kind of contests now starting to grow in the work platforms and in the gig economy and in some of these expert talent marketplaces? And when we took a step back, what we realized was that, that the real problem that we're facing is a pace of technology change. Mm -hmm. Technology has changed forever. Uh, you know, it's just before our organizations and our skills and our workforce could adapt. There was enough time to take another course. There was enough time for universities to adapt their training. There was enough time for, for really you to go and use that strategy of recruit and retain talent as the way to really build a workforce that could could do whatever it needed to do right um but this technology explosion that's happened and, and i, I in the presentations i do i talk about how huge that is right so one of the numbers i use is yeah it's 90 percent of all scientists that have ever lived are alive today 90 percent like nine times as many are working today than ever existed before. And that has caused just this enormous amount of technology to, to start swirling and building. And with that technology, our new skills, our new expertise, right? So they're, they're, they're combined. Um, and so that old mechanism that our, our organizations for 100 years now have used to recruit and retain talent it kind of breaks that model, right? Because now I've got new skills that are coming on board, you know, whether that's a cybersecurity or whether that's around materials, whether that's around 3D printing, whatever it is, 
machine learning, right? That's a huge one we're trying to, to get right now. Yeah. That Those skills are coming so fast that if your st only strategy is recruit and retain talent, what you find is you can't actually recruit people fast enough because you have to lay off people on the other side if, if, if unless you have an unlimited supply of money, right? And so this idea of bringing people full time at that rate, you really can't, you can't, uh, organizations can't sustain that. Um, on top of all that, a lot of these new skills are in high demand. One of the things about these skills uh, and these technologies is that many of them like machine learning, like additive manufacturing, like uh, CRISPR, like uh, software and software APIs, they don't apply to one industry, they apply to every industry. And so suddenly we're stuck where the universities aren't necessarily training the latest and greatest because they still are trying to catch up as well. And so it's a smaller pool already. And that pool is being distributed across almost every industry. And so we wonder when we go to try to find a data scientist or some, you know, somebody that can do 3D printing, it's very hard to find those people. And, and the other thing that we found, which this was just fascinating when we found it, now everyone's talking about it, is five years ago, we saw this study or I guess it was, yeah, uh, 2017 with Edelman Intelligence that was showing this increase in people moving to the gig workforce and out of full-time jobs. And it showed that by 2027, there would be more gig workers than full-time, but then the pandemic hit and it just sped all of that up, right? And so it now- It has really the, accelerated the, that trend, right? So it hasn't exactly, stopped it yeah. because I think that many people would expect that people are looking for more stability and that it would yep. actually keep their talents in-house but as the global trend shows it's actually even accelerating that trend more than we have expected exactly and and it's it's almost counterintuitive as you just said right that that people in this time of crisis are leaving the security of full-time jobs now i think there's several factors there um, i actually saw a survey just recently that that talked about 90 plus percent of those surveyed said that the pandemic made them want to leave their job because they didn't want to uh, live out there. Like it, it, they really thought about their mortality and how they were spending their time and they really wanted to live out their passion. And this is a really fascinating thing because we think that a lot of the workforce was has been captured by full-time employment and, and really not doing what they enjoyed. I tell people that Dilbert cartoons are real, right? This, this dissatisfaction with having to work for someone who doesn't really have your best interests at heart uh, all the time, that that's really something people are, are looking for alternatives. And suddenly there are now these work platforms, right? Where as a freelancer, you don't have to do what you used to do, right? You used to have to, if you were a freelancer, you had to do all your own marketing, find all your own customers. It was very hard to do. But now you have platforms where you can join, you get support from other freelancers, you can actually uh, find training resources. And then on top of all that, the platform finds you a global marketplace for whatever your, your expertise or product is and brings that to you that is starting to really change uh, the way that, that people can be entrepreneurial. It kind of brings down those barriers of entry. Unfortunately for regular organizations, this is crisis, right? Because suddenly the workforce isn't applying that they, they don't want our full-time jobs, right? Um, or at least and I think not, the, that, not the talents, but they are looking for. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that, that we've seen, uh, a lot of the, the security you talked about has degraded over time, right? Where companies would suddenly automate a large portion of their work and lay off people and people were seeing their benefits degrade. And in, in you know, the US, the, the benefits are very much tied to the company you work for. There's not a government program. Um, and so, you know, things like healthcare are, are, are real for a lot of people that don't have that in their, in their uh, government provided benefits. And so there's really this kind of new world we're living in where companies are having to reformulate their staffing plans because of this new shortage. And what we're telling a lot of organizations is, look, 
<laughs> you now have to have a plan for actually bringing in open talent because that's going to be the only way you're going to find them. If you're only fixed on full-time employment as your only option, you are probably going to suffer. Um, and the, this, what a lot of companies are trying to do is, I think we talked about a little before this, is reach within their company and re reformulate the people within there so that they have these internal mar talent marketplaces. And that is a smart thing to do, right? Make the most of what you have. If you already have those folks, you know, actually get those people redeployed. But that's only part of the problem, right? Um, we have to be more efficient about how we do that. But I would say the additional capability that has to augment that as well is to be able to go outside of your organization and access those skills that are really hard to find and, and do it in a way, right, that they can integrate and on-ramp with your team and work uh, really interactively uh, as part of the team. Yeah, so I think that one of the, um, the biggest threatening elements uh, of all these open source talents being brought into organizations is probably about the culture. So how much have you heard about it if companies are feeling kind of like a barrier that they don't know how they are going to obviously keep their secrets and data safe and, and all those, that, that's it, the technical part. But I think the other yeah. component is definitely about culture. So what does your experience say with, with that? How yeah. culture of organizations need to change to be adaptive yeah. to these new types of talent market? That's a great question. Um, I think one, there's an element within what you just put into the umbrella of culture that's trust, right? How can I trust people that aren't in my organization? Like, cause we, we, we kind of had this feeling from our hundred years of working in this latest model that, that if they're part of our company, they're part of our culture, we can trust them, right? We've done, we've done our due diligence and now we can trust them. I think there's a false sense of security in that. I think you actually find that, that, if you look at where the leaks for secure information are, they're mostly in employees. Um, and there are new ways of trust being uh, experimented with in the open talent platforms to where there is more of a digital trust trail where you can actually see exactly what someone has done and why you should trust them. Um, so in, you know, an NDA with an internal person versus an NDA with a freelancer or somebody who's outside of your organization that's, that's a perception, right? It's, it's can I trust them? And the, and the trust goes beyond just, will they share my secrets, but will they be able to do the job? Will they show up? All of these things. And it comes down to reputation. And the, the analogy I like to show for people is Uber, right? You guys have oh, Uber, yeah. right? So I don't know if you remember, but I'm fairly certain that, that everyone uh, around you had the same reaction I did when Uber first came out, which was, there is no way I'm going to get into a stranger's car. That is just dangerous, right? The same with Airbnb. There's no way I'm going to go sleep in someone else's house on their bed. That's, ooh. But now those platforms have been very successful because they have built the trust, right? But think about it. The steps that they take to screen drivers and whatnot, they're not that fancy. Like they're, the possibility of, of something bad happen actually probably didn't change with the steps they did. They just were able to establish those criteria in a, in a way that statistically they could show this really is safe. The same is going on in the freelance capability. Most all freelancers have a well-established profile that you can go look. A lot of them have backgrounds. Some have even security clearances. Um, there's kind of two levels of that freelance workforce. There's and I say two level. it is a whole spectrum, but most people, when they hear the word freelance workforce, they think Uber driver or Uber eats or delivery services, but they don't think about the actually very rich high end freelance world. And that's actually what most impacts the workforce that we're talking about here. And that is a real um, diverse set all the way up to CEOs. You can go freelance a CEO if you're a, if you're a startup company. Like, and if you think about it, that's probably a better idea because you can't pay a salary of an experienced CEO if you bought them full time, 
right? And so there's this idea of, of matching skills and bringing them up and then bringing that trust. And so there, there are new work at velocity.com and uh, I think Workonomics, other using kind of blockchain based uh, systems to actually start uh, establishing a more uh, shared understanding of trust that, that you can kind of point to something and, and look and see with high confidence uh, what this person's experience is, how they can be trusted. But it is something that, that is kind of a barrier of entry to using these new open talent marketplaces. Um, and, and before anyone's gonna provision someone on, they need to know, hey, I'm, this person's not gonna go corrupt my system. One other add-on to this is if, if you have any of your folks that are, are into kind of the new zero trust architectures in IT, those zero trust architectures are perfect for freelancers because freelancers can come and work on a zero trust architecture and build a system. And because of that zero trust architecture, they do not have access to anything else. And so the, if, if they do something bad, it is very localized and can be detected quickly before it spreads. And in fact, it can't spread by the very nature of the architecture. So some of these things are going to become less of a concern because of the way the IT infrastructure is changing. So, okay, so I think um, it, it's quite clear that trust is like a fundamental basis to open towards these type of uh, new talent markets. But one interesting question just popped to my mind because I think one of the things that the company is struggling with it is can I, educate or reskill the workforce fast enough yeah. uh, compared to the changes. But do these yeah. freelancers who has been in somewhere in, in a company as an FTE earlier, do they learn faster or better or do they put yeah. more um, efforts into keeping up with the speed of the change? That is such a great question because we actually do see that in the data. There's an Edelman intelligence survey that showed that freelancers were upskilling at about 10 or 15% higher rates than normal workers. Uh, and if you think about that, that actually makes sense because the average budget in a company to train employees is something like a thousand US dollars per employee per year. And most of that training budget is spent on safety and security certification. It's not even built for upskilling, right? But if you're in an organization, what is your incentive to do training above and beyond what they're going to pay for? It's almost zero, right? You're going to train only at what they will let you. And, and those budgets are very restrictive on what they will let you train. On the flip side of that is freelancers. Well, freelancers know that the more skill they have, the more value that they bring. And so they're actually working in a marketplace model where they're constantly trying to upskill. I was on a panel with one of the top coder uh, freelancers that was kind of one of their lead freelancers. And in the panel, I asked him, how much of your time do you upskill? How much time do you learn new software packages and, and learn new, new languages and things like that? And he said 60% of his time, six oh, zero. Okay. And I said, how do you make any money? Uh, like you're only working 40% of your time. And he, and he said, well, I work in Greece and I'm making five to six times what anyone else in Greece is making. Mm -hmm. And it's because he's learning the most valuable skills. And there's a whole nother piece of this equation. The average productivity within an organization is something like 37%. It's very low. Now, and, and that's not just people goofing off. That's people having to go to meetings. There's the overhead of just working. And if you look at that, what that means is someone's really only productive three to four hours a day. And the other three to four, four to five hours of, of work that they're performing there is really not useful, right? But you're keeping them captive and you're not upskilling, right? Versus the freelancer who's also productive like that and working three or four hours a day, but they're getting paid more and they're using that excess time to train. And I think this is a real change in model. There's a World Economic Forum report that came out in October of 2020. And it basically said that 50% of the jobs need upskilling. 50% of your employees mm -hmm. need upskilling. 
and it's 40% of your job changes. And the training required to get to these new skills that everyone's going to need is something like one to six months worth of training. There's nobody's budget in the organization is ready for that. And so yeah, that's really, if you look organizationally, our HR departments are kind of stuck because they can't get a 10 times or a 20 times increase in their training budgets to upskill everyone. People within organizations resist changing, right? Because it's not their idea. It, there's there's a self-motivation to, to training that's very interesting uh, as part of this. And so when you're trying to get your accountants to learn data science, because that's really, you know your accountants are going to go away and you know you're going to need data science, they'll resist that within an organization. But in the freelance world, that kind of natural uh, work, kind of uh, just that natural transition happens because people self-select. Uh, but it's a very interesting time because how do you how do you kind of reconcile the old way and the new way all at the same time and and get that training to everyone you need? It's a it's a conundrum. I I do not envy any CEO at this point uh, in the world uh, because there is just so much change. I think the good news is that we have some solutions. So just as we discussed, there is a way to open up the more open source mm -hmm. talents. Those talents might be even better and gaining new skills on, on actually constantly because this is in the nature of living and how they are organizing themselves. That could be also motivating for your internal workforce because then they, they feel that they need to compete in a way with those talents whom you might bring in from yeah. the market. Yeah. So I think yeah. these are interesting um, opportunities, but that actually tells me that somehow HR itself has to change a lot because this is really different how you manage such a very much diversified workforce uh, within an organization. So um, let's say as a closing um, of this conversation, which could, I'm sure go on for like an hour or two more uh, with all the experiences at least I'm enjoying it. So I'm, I'm almost sure that everyone else is does as well um but let's see as, as a takeaway so if there is like um a book or a report or anything what you would suggest yeah. to the hungarian hr community and those um hr leaders who are struggling with the same problems and would use something for inspiration would you suggest something um to, to read you know before they are going sure, to sleep sure. with all oh those thoughts in their mind there, there are so many great resources. I think on this topic, uh, Jeff Schwartz just came out with a book not too long ago called Work Disrupted. Uh, and I find that to be a, a really good kind of primer on this new kind of workforce economy. Um, the other big kind of factor that we didn't talk about today is the digital transformation, which is really also a big factor in this. And Kareem Lakani and Marco and City wrote a book uh, out of Harvard Business School called uh, Competing in the Age of AI. I think both of those books are excellent uh, ways to kind of frame where we are and where businesses have to go uh, in order to stay competitive uh, because it is, it is just such a different environment that we're in. So, yeah. And it is changing day by day. So I'm sure we are soon going to have enough reason to talk to you again. And thank you very much, Stephen, again for attending this conversation. And we really hope to see you um, somewhere in Hungary as well as one of our events. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you. thank you so much, Eva. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. Goodbye. Cheers. <laughs>